there is the perception and the attempt to market this current version of, uh, of, of American militarism as something clean, or you know, so that the massive ground invasions of Iraq or in Afghanistan with 200,000 troops on the ground in a nation-building enterprise, it, and it was, became incredibly dirty incredibly quickly, and you know, hundreds of thousands of civilians were killed. But somehow drone strikes, special operations forces, uh, was clean, and, and we wanted that to be clear that it wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. Dirty Wars has turned into, um, it, it's been interesting to watch it on Twitter and other places, turn into kind of a trope and a term that people, a meme that people used to talk about this, because what words do we have for it? It's a, it's a borderless covert war that we know very little about that happens in the shadows that people are struggle even to name. Was the story always about you? Were you always going to be the, the central figure? I've, I haven't done anything else in my adult life except, except be a journalist, and I don't know what I would do if I wasn't doing this, but I, I don't write articles about me. Um, and a lot of what I've done as a reporter over the years is to try to go to places to uh, tell the stories of people that would not be told if we weren't there. And we had always talked about doing a big project together. And Rick had been spending a lot of time embedded in Afghanistan, and I was just finishing a a major investigative project on the mercenary company Blackwater. You know, we have embedded journalists that are with the Marines, and we see, you know, through embedded reporting, uh, what they're doing in Helmand Province or Marja or something like that. Um, but then there was, th there seemed to be this other war that was intensifying uh, months after President Obama took office, and it was this sort of special operations war in Afghanistan. We scrounged together money, and uh, and we rolled very cheap. You know, we. Uh, we stayed in the same room. Uh, we didn't have any security, and uh, and we started investigating a series of night raids. and um, And at first, the idea was that I was sort of going to be um, just like a tour guide through this archipelago of uh, covert war sites. We brought in our friend David Riker, who's a um, a feature film director and writer, and he was really going to just work with us for like two weeks. I think we had how long was the rough cut? It was. A four hour rough cut. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we were going to tell the entire history of Somalia from 1960 to the present. Somalia in our original cut was like 40 minutes long. Here it's four. And David started doing something with both Rick and myself. He was interviewing us and saying, well, how did it feel when you rode into this village? What's it like to be the first Americans these people have met since their home was raided? And would take copious notes. And then, and he didn't make any suggestions in that two week period. At the end of the two weeks, he starts sending us emails with our own stories in them and said, you know, what if instead of just telling it through sort of the lens of the, the raw facts of what happened, you, you bring the viewer on a journey with you? The only way that it was safe for us to work was as a two-man team. So I was, you know, Jeremy was producer, line producer, AP, ca on-camera personality and, and everything. I was director, cameraman, sound person, like the whole, the whole thing. I mean, that was, we, we had to travel on a tiny crew like that because it was the only way that it was possible with security. Um, and, and it produced a kind of intimacy too with people. It was easy to, you know, it, it, we created different relations with people by traveling that way as well. Rick and I were both, I think, shattered individuals at one point, um, a couple years into the uh, invasion and occupation of Iraq. This whole circle of people who had covered the war and knew people that had been killed uh, I, th I, th I think we reached a point in 2004, 2005. Um, I mean, I, re I remember uh, being with Rick at a bar one night and looking at him and, and thinking, you know, this is a dead man walking. He just doesn't look human anymore. And then we talked about it later, and Rick said, I thought the same thing about you. And um, I think it took us both, both a couple of years to rebuild ourselves as people to be able to do a project like this. And I think both of us believe um, that we have a job to, in a democratic society, that you have to have people willing to go to the other side of the barrel of the gun and meet with people that were told are the enemy and to tell their stories in a human way. You know, you see these beautiful images of children in our film, and there's one scene at the end, this little girl, the Yemeni girl with those piercing eyes. If you were to blow up her eyes and look at it, uh, what you see is the reflection of me and Rick standing there, Rick with his camera and me standing in front of this little girl. You can actually see us clear as day in her eyes if you blow it up. And I've thought about that image a lot, and, and I've thought about it in the context of the way we respond to the school shootings, you know, in Sandy Hook or Newtown. All of us watch those events, and we know the stories. Everyone in this room probably knows the story of that eight-year-old kid killed in the Boston Marathon bombing and that beautiful picture that he had, he had drawn calling for peace. Why shouldn't we view people, children in Yemen, the same way? What was that little girl's picture? You know, what were her dreams or aspirations? And I think 
we don't pretend to have answers. We're not politicians or lobbyists or advocates. You know, whenever we go, wherever I've gone, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, you go and the hospitality and the and the well the way that people welcome you into their lives and like in Yemen they people kept the shreds the little pieces of shrapnel and bombs and and like little you know ev the all the material evidence they could gather they collected and they kept in like a box in their in their room and they kept it there you know waiting for someone like us to come so they could tell their story and prove it to them because they believed that their story would make a difference somehow and they knew we were Americans. We were from the country that these missiles came from. Uh, and so they believed in us, in us as a country. And they believed in America enough to believe that if Americans knew their story and had this evidence before them and could see with their own eyes what was happening, that that would make a difference.